I'm the only person on the planet that's come up with this formula for wealth. I believe it to be the most accurate formula for wealth that there is out there. Wealth equals... Wealth. I have a very, very, very special guest, Mr. Rob Moore. A self-made property investor, businessman, entrepreneur, author of 18 best-selling books, double world record holder, speaker, pilot, and proud dad. I'd wanted to be an entrepreneur probably from the age of six, and I just wanted to be like my dad. He was really a, a hustler. I don't think the problem is opportunity. I think the problem is overwhelm. The paradox of so much choice, so much choice of social media, so much choice of product, going to the supermarket, 28,000 brands on every product. Why do more people not go, I'm going to try? Because they're worried about what other people will think and say. If you wait until you're perfect before you start, you'll never start. But I think a lot of people are scared about starting before they're ready in case they look like an imposter. I'm going to say something which everyone says, and I don't know what it means. You know, everyone says, just be yourself. <laughs> what does that mean? I was nearly 26. I was about 50 grand in debt. I had these days or weeks of hating myself and feeling completely lost in life. Really lost. What do you want to say and what do you want to be known for? Because social media can become a trap. And if you just use social media to talk about anything and everything in the end, no one will hear your voice. Losing that old school connection of those relationships. Is that something that is happening right now? Is that a road we're going down? I can completely understand why now, as someone dating and getting into relationships, oh, it is like overwhelming as hell. And when I dated, I had to look at a girl over there and suck it up and neck a pint and brave it yeah. and go and talk to her. There was no <laughs> mis-selling. <laughs> you were getting the yeah, package. Yeah, exactly. What you see is what you get. <laughs> is risk a real thing? Is it risky to quit your job? No. Of course it's not risky because you can quit your job, try something, and then you can go back and get another job. Get another but you job. think it's risky. Oh yeah, but I've got kids and I've got mortgages. Risk is in our own head. If you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Just tell us a little bit about this fight coming up. I just got called out and I just thought, you're a mouthy twat. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not a boxer, and I'm not Jake Paul, but I'm gonna knock Samuel Leeds out. I'm gonna win that fight. He's gonna wish he hadn't gone in that ring with me. This guy is no joke, and I could get cleaned out in front of a lot of people, and that's a risk, and that's why I'm gonna win. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I have a very, very, very special guest, Mr. Rob Moore. Now, dude, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Always a pleasure and ever a chore. There we go. I love it. Now, I just want to introduce you as almost like the ultimate entrepreneur. There's not a lot that you're not doing right now, which we're going to get into in the podcast anyway. But look, it's very unlikely but let's just have that nice wide angle of what you're up to right now and a little bit about your journey. Okay, so um, I think I've written 18 books and most of those are on property and business and entrepreneurship. Have the Disruptors podcast, which is in its eighth year. Um, I have the UK's largest property training company called Progressive Property. We did 18 million in sales last year, which we're really happy with because Lockdown really hit that business hard because it's an events business. Um, a property investor, so my business partner and I have, he just told me yesterday, we went through some of the numbers yesterday. We just got one of our buildings revalued just over 19 million. We get 3.4 million in rent. We have 360 units that we own and 1,350 tenants in our management company. And I know that's 100% accurate because we had a meeting about this yesterday. <laughs> uh, and what else do I do? Um, well, 17 years ago, um, I was nearly 26 and lost, really lost. Um, I was about 50 grand in debt and I'd wanted to be an entrepreneur probably from the age of six. So it sounds weird, but my dad always had pubs and bars and clubs and restaurants and he was really a, a hustler and he always had big wedges of cash in his hand and he was always trading in cash and he was buying and selling pubs and we're always moving around and I just wanted to be like my dad and it was weird because I was more entrepreneurial before the age of 10 as I was when I was 25 and a half working in my dad's pub and the school system didn't work for me at all university just wasn't right for what I felt like a misfit 
And on December the 15th, 2005, in my dad's pub, I was 15 grand in debt. I'm working in the bar and in 200 quid a week, spending 300 quid a week, getting more into debt. My dad's grinding himself down. He's been 30 years in the pub trade. My mum's getting arthritis. My sister hates it there. And it was all like I felt like something was going to give. And my dad had this massive nervous breakdown in his pub. He got arrested, sectioned, beaten up by the police in front of all of the customers. And um, I had these days or weeks of hating myself and feeling completely lost in life. And two people, my dad and a gallery owner of some part-time art I was doing, had said to me, you should be getting into property, mate. And I'm like, well, what do I know about property? I don't have any money. Um, but because, you know, my dad was in hospital and I was lost, I thought, well, I might as well start looking. So I went to this local property networking event in Peterborough, end of, end of December 05, and I met my business partner, Mark Homer there. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all started. Um, I think we've done about 150 million in um, sales in that, the training business. Um, we're heavily looking to buy more properties now because we think that the market's probably going to turn. I've, I broke a couple of world records for public speaking. Um, yeah, that's probably like the the short version, which I think is what you wanted. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. look, I've 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 listened actually to a lot of your books as well, and I, you know they've been they've been great books to really open your eyes. And and what I will say for anyone watching that doesn't yet know Rob or you know knows about Rob, one thing I do like is looking from the outside in at your journey. When businesses scale and times move forward, and obviously COVID progressed everything like at a rapid pace you've kept up and i really like the fact that you've adapted and you've moved on to well we call it social media i want to get into this with you it the word is used as social media but i see it and i'm sure you do as it's business you know there's a chance to uh, get new eyes on what you're doing add value and then hopefully you know generate um well some revenue and, and develop a business. And I like the fact that you've always adapted through the avenues that we all have resources to, because I'm a real big believer in no excuses. And where I want to kick this off is we have so much at our fingertips. And I think a lot of people still fall back on, I can't do it. You know, you can't start a business. You can't really monetize that. You know, it's, I'm limited to what I can do. And I want to kick this off with how much opportunity do you see for people who are action takers right now? Because I just see an abundance of it. Yeah, I don't think the problem is opportunity. I think the problem is overwhelm. Yeah, yeah. Because the paradox of so much choice, so much choice of social media, so much choice of product, going to the supermarket, 28,000 brands on every product, the paradox of choice is it becomes overwhelming. So things like adaption. So, you know, it's not the strongest that survive. It's those that are most adaptable to change. That quote kind of suited me as an entrepreneur because for me, variety is one of my highest values as an entrepreneur and I need variety. That freedom to be able to go where I want to go, that's why I chose to be an entrepreneur. So that part of it wasn't too difficult for me in terms of, oh, podcast, new social media channel. Ooh. Um, but yeah, I think people's problems right now is overwhelm, not a lack of opportunity. So for someone who's a bit overwhelmed, a bit lost, or just doesn't know where to go next, I think you should pick an amount of time, let's say three, six, 12 months, where part-time you try shit. I wrote a book called Start Now, Get Perfect Later. Yeah. And, and if you wait until you're perfect before you start, you'll never start. Um, but I think a lot of people are scared, scared about starting before they're ready in case they look like an imposter mm. or you know, you don't know what you're talking about and they get criticized, etc. But imagine that no one in the world was judging or watching and you got a free year in your life. You could have it back at the end. You got a free year. Go and try some shit. Yeah. Try a social media channel, try lives, try audios, try podcasts, try e-commerce, try property, try whatever. And when you get to that three, six or 12 months, then evaluate having tried a few things and work out, okay, what do I think fits best with me? And that might be... Um, my lifestyle, it might be the amount of money I want want to make, it might be how much passion I've got for it, it might be whether it's trending and there's a good opportunity in that space or niche. And then what you do is you just work out if you want to be part-time, full-time or big-time. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be part-time, keep your job. Because there's a lot of people in my space that are like, well, you're a fucking loser if you um, you know, work for a living. If, yeah. if you've got a job just over broke, loser. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tim, Tim Cook's not just over broke. 
He's worth hundreds of millions and he's employed. So um, don't listen to all that bullshit. At the end of the day, there's part-time, full-time or big-time. There's intrapreneur, entrepreneur or empire builder. So in property, if you buy one property a year for 30 years, you're going to retire well. And you might do that and you want to be a nurse as well. Good on you. Don't let anyone tell you that's wrong. But if, like me and maybe, you know, many of your listeners, you fucking hate being told what to do. You're a rebel with the cause. You want to do the opposite of what everyone's telling you. <laughs> the more people tell you not to do something, the more you want to do it. That probably is inside telling you you need to be an entrepreneur. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, here's what you do. You work evenings and weekends in your current employment. You keep your bills going over. You set 12, 18 months in the future to match your three grand a month or five grand a month. You hustle, you do what it takes. And as soon as you hit the figure, you quit and then you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, I, I align with all of it. I align with all of it because it starts with finances. So many people start thinking about um, getting out and just jumping straight into it. Whereas I'm a massive believer and, and real preacher of, you know, if you can, uh, there's a lot of shift work now as well, like run the job, but get your finances right. Have a buffer. And when I talk about a buffer and finances, people always say, well, how much should I have by? My view on it is just, just my two pence worth is have, have your rainy day, your emergency, have a maintenance fund, but then have your floating fund, which will balance you out for however long it's going to take. Because with you as well, uh, I think when people know that there's this like abundance of opportunity, it's like, what, what? why should I remain? Why shouldn't I explore options? And I think you go through, like you say, if you had that, I like that take of having a free year where you can just try stuff because it's a tick box at the beginning, isn't it? Or a cross box. Yeah. Don't want to do that. Tried yeah. it. Don't want to do that. Tried it. And, and risk. Let's um, let's cover risk. I know a lot of people, we've all heard this where they go, oh, Rob, you're doing that. Sounds risky. Well, I wouldn't do that. Is risk a real thing? What's your views on risk? Yeah, risk is a real thing. So when there's runs on banks like there are right now, that makes you think whether you should keep your money in a bank. And banks are supposed to be safe. That's one of the reasons why you get low interest. And if banks aren't safe, you want a higher interest to offset the risk. So risk is a real thing. But I like to look at risk in two ways. One, is it, am I just feeling it emotionally? Or two, is it actually really a physical risk? So we were talking about the ice bath. Really, that, that first couple of seconds getting in the ice bath that's three degrees, you know, you hear a shriek coming out of me. But once you're in there for 15 to 30 seconds, your body gets used to it. So it's just that initial feeling. In fact, it's not the first two or three seconds. It's thinking about getting in and how that first two or three seconds will be. And I like to see risk like that. So is it risky to quit your job? No. No. Of course it's not risky because you can quit your job, try something, and then you can go back and get another job. Get another but you job. think... Yeah. It's risky. Oh, yeah, but I've got kids and I've got mortgages and blah, blah. Yeah, but if I had a gun to your head and said, go and find a new job in 30 days or less. <laughs> You'd find the job. You're going to go and find the job. So there's financial risk. And look, I want to challenge something you said because I, I agree with you that you agreed with me that you can build up an amount of money before you quit your job. But that can also take five or 10 years or there's no motivation to get there. Now, I yeah. was forced because I was fired. I got myself and my business partner fired from pretty much the only job I had that wasn't employed by my family. And that was scary for a while, but it was a great gift because, you know, I, I was working 18 hour days then when I started. I don't anymore, but I was working 18 hour days. And, you know, human beings are amazingly resourceful. The problem is because our, we're not pushed our resourcefulness just stays inside. So if someone's been procrastinating for 12 years and still trying to save enough to start a job, you should probably just stop procrastinating and just try it. Yeah. Because the worst that'll happen is you tried it three, six, 12 months, you burn through a bit of money and you go back and you get another job. So yeah, I think mostly risk is in our own head. But why don't yeah. more of us have that attitude of this is what's crazy. I find it the school effect. Do you remember when you were at school? I got my little, oh, by the way, real proud moment. I actually have my boy in the studio for the first time. But, you know, when... And he's when, not listening. Oh, he's listening <laughs> he to is you. He's listening. Yes. He's listening yeah. now. Headphones proud, are off. Proud, proud dad moment. But when you're at school and if you get detention, do you think the world's over? Do you think, oh my God, you know, you don't. <laughs> well, I remember when I was at school, in primary school, that feeling of, oh my God, everything's over. I've got detention or I'm on report. And it's not until you leave and you think, 
what was I worrying about? I think it's the same with a job. I don't know. Why do, why do more people not have that attitude of, I'm going to give it a go. So, because this is going to be another topic, really interested to hear what you think. So I don't get to this midlife crisis where I look back at my life with a bit of resentment and regret. Is that why you got me on the show? Because I'm 43 and I'm, I'm in that midlife <laughs> age bracket. Hey, I'll, t- I'll tell you, I bet you're not having a midlife crisis. But I bet, you know, there's a lot of people that I think get down the road and it comes down to why didn't I give it a go? Why do not? Why do more people not go? I'm going to try. Honestly, yeah. I think if you were to paint me into that corner to give just one reason why people don't give it a go, because they're worried about what other people will think and say. I think full stop. Amen. End of paragraph. Yeah. Um, because let me ask you this: If you not only if you didn't care what other people thought, but if what other people thought wasn't in your mind when you made a decision, what might you do? I was having a chat with Ollie Ollerton on my show and he said, sometimes imagine I'm the only person on earth. What would I do? Well, he wouldn't be worrying about what everyone else thought because there's no one else there. <laughs> yeah. So I th- I'm just going to throw it out there that it could be 90%, 95% plus of the reasons we don't try things are because we're worried about what other people say. Mm. Now, that's the wrong reason to make the decision. The right reason to make the decision is if it's right for you or not. Now, you, you might find this a bit weird me saying this, but not everyone should be an entrepreneur. And I don't want everyone to be an entrepreneur. I have 150 staff in the office, about 105, and then the outsourcers make up the rest. I don't want them all to fire me and go and be an entrepreneur. Otherwise, yeah. I'm doing all my own jobs. <laughs> So there's, a, there's some people in my space are like, everyone oh, should be an entrepreneur and going on TikTok and going into bars and restaurants and saying, why don't you set up your own job? Why don't you quit that place and set, be an entrepreneur? No, not everyone should be an entrepreneur. Tim Cook's not an entrepreneur. He fucking runs Apple. Yeah. And he is not an entrepreneur. He is an intrapreneur. So if you are passionate about something like being a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer, you don't want to be a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer or be employed in a, in a great firm. Go and work with a great firm. The little hybrid we've got right now, which maybe didn't exist a couple of decades ago, is what what we call the intrapreneur. So here's a little tip for someone. Um, If you want to sort of take risk, but not too much, go and work for someone who is an entrepreneur. Mm. Get a half-decent job on a half-decent wage, but you're working with someone who you think, you know what, I might want to do that one day. You're almost like, learning and earning at the same time you're almost like an apprentice on the tools learning from like that jordan belfort show me a check for seventy thousand dollars and i'll work for you right now yeah yeah very very similar yeah so there's ways to mitigate risk but the difficulty i'm going to say something which everyone says and i don't know what it means but you know everyone says just be yourself what (laughs) what does that mean (laughs) what does that mean but i think If you don't worry about what other people think when you're making decisions and you think what's best for, not me selfishly, because you've got children and um, responsibilities, but in my soul, what is it I think I want to do with my life and pursue that road, you won't go far wrong. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting one that you say that because uh, this was a conversation I had recently with Simon Leslie. Simon Leslie's done very well in business. Um, and it actually is two things. Like Benji Leslie, when we had him back on, uh, a good friend of ours, he said, imagine in a warehouse where you care about what everyone thinks. Now, now the reality is, now imagine who really cares and there's no one in that warehouse. Like that's, I do agree with you. I think a lot of people worry about what people think. And I, my personal opinion, I think you make really good strides, not only in personal life, but professionally when you are content. And like you say, you know, there's, there's this whole uh, know yourself. Sam Vanderpump sort of laughed at that because it is, it's like, what, what does this mean? I think it's more of a case of being I, I don't, I'm not actually bothered what anyone thinks. Like I'm, a, I'm in my own lane and I'm making good strides. I think, I think that's where we're all at. But yeah, it's this opinion of others that we all seem to worry about. And do you think that ties into this? Is midlife crisis a real thing, or is that a case of you do get to a certain point in your life and you think, "Fuck it, I should have given it a go," but am I too late? 
Well, apparently I'm right at the age where I'm supposed to have a big midlife crisis. You've got to go buy a Ferrari now. Yeah. Or another one. I have seven cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've certainly had to go and buy a Lamborghini, go and buy a Ferrari, go and buy an old school classic 911 Turbo, go and buy an Aerial Atom, go and buy a race car, go and fly a helicopter. If that's what makes a midlife crisis, I've done all that. I don't think that makes a midlife crisis. I don't know. I think a midlife crisis is just a nice little buzzword. I think when you get to your 40s, let's say, um, which I'm probably the only one in the room that knows this. I'm guessing I'm, I'm older than you all oh, is. Paul's 45. Uh, no, he's <laughs> not. <laughs> so you've had enough time to have had two or three or four careers and two or three or four marriages. Um, so you've had, you know, when you're 25, you haven't had enough time probably to start and stop and create and break enough. So I just think, the longer you've lived, the more time you've had to try stuff, succeed at stuff and fail at stuff. But I'm not buying into this midlife crisis nonsense. Mm. I, I, I think it's an excuse. OK, look, this thing's like your testosterone levels can go right down. You can obviously go into the menopause when you, you know, you're a woman. And those kind of things can probably affect you. But I don't really buy into labels. I don't like labels. And anytime anyone tries to stick a label on me, I immediately want to peel it off and go, no, I'm not that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes some of the ladies in my office say, well, well, because you're a man. So, yeah. What has what's that got to do with anything? Yeah. No, I am me. And we're all an individual. So now I, I don't know where this midlife crisis. I think we're used to identity of, came from. I think we're used to a lot of old narratives. I, th I think there's so many old words out there that still linger about and people still use them. I feel like we're waiting for a generation to move on until these words are gone. I, I want to ask you, for someone who is extremely busy, I'm really interested to hear what you've got to say about this because I think my decision on balance, life balance, work-life balance, balance in general, I think it's a case of sometimes it's just ad hoc, day by day, because I heard a great saying, again, from a good friend of mine, when I said to him, and he was in business, he's done very well in business, I said to him, did you ever find balance? And he said, do you ever see a seesaw with two people on it that's still? And I thought, that's a good one. What's your, what's your view on balance? Yeah, I've heard people say that they like the word blend more than balance, or there's no such thing as balance, but there is blend. And I can see what they're saying. Um, so I have this fundamental belief about the way that life works is that in any person, event or situation, everything is neutral. And we as humans project positivity or negativity onto it. So therefore, every situation, person or event is equally upside and downside loaded. So because of that, if you work like a dog, you could become a millionaire in three to five years. You could become a deca millionaire in five plus and you could build a million followers in 18 months mm. and be single and overweight. If you spend all your money on your health, because by the way, supplements and food and everything else now is really expensive. Mm -hmm. My wife spends two and a half thousand pound a month on supplements, you know, for, for the family. Um, and that's not even including the food. And so you can spend all your money on food and be healthy, but have no material items and no sort of material wealth. Um, so I think it's about what are you prepared to sacrifice and what are you prepared to trade off? Mm. So for me, I was quite prepared to trade off alcohol because it got in the way of being an entrepreneur. I was quite prepared to trade off late nights because it got in the way of an entrepreneur. And I was quite prepared to trade off old social circles because it got in the way of being an entrepreneur. So they were sacrifices I was prepared to trade off. To me, that's not balance. That's what I'm prepared to give up mm. in order to be what I want to be. But then you need to know what you want to be in order to know what you've got to give up because you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And this is important. So I'd probably say, look at your life and go, where am I at? And if you're single, now's the time to hustle. Mm -hmm. And if you're young, now's the time to hustle. Dig the foundations deep. Because as you could turn 30 and 35 and you have a child or two and you get into a relationship, if you want to maintain that relationship, you've got to give it time and energy. 
Then there's some little hacks. And I wrote a book called Life Leverage, which is sort of basically about life hacks. So number one, I always merge holiday with business. So we'll go away as a family and we'll stay somewhere nice. But I'll do a couple of talks or I'll run an event there so I can blend that holiday and that work. And um, often my kids like, you know, your son is here with you here, will come with me to speaking gigs I've got and stuff like that. When I write a book, I'll go and go away for two weeks and the family can go somewhere nice and I'll get my head down and write a book. So if there's ways as an entrepreneur, you can blend things together. I'll give you another little hack, which people think is a luxury, but it's not getting a driver. Um, so I was coaching some of my guys yesterday and some of my guys who um, they're on about 1500 pound a speech. And I said to them, well, now you can afford to get a driver for 300 quid. And they're like, oh, 300 quid for a driver. But yeah, how much work can you get done in the car? Mm. And, you know, took Paul about a week to get here because of the strikes. Well, I was going to say, Harry, I hope you're up bu bumping up your price now. <laughs> well, Harry is now my driver. <laughs> so Harry is head producer and, and he's driving out of choice, by the way. He gets to drive a £160,000 car, so he's pretty happy. Throw it a fee. Um, well, there is he's, that. he's trying to get the Lambo next, aren't you? But um, that's not as comfortable. <laughs> I'll be your driver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's ways that you can get this net time leverage and blend things together where you've got a little bit of life hacking. You know, like the ice bath, it makes you feel really good. It apparently is really good for inflammation. So I, after each time I train, because I'm training a lot at the moment, I, I'll get in that. And then you can stick it on social media and maybe you can get sponsored by a company and they'll give you one. So there's ways you can merge it all in. Yeah. Oh, great, great answer. Funny, I just want to touch on your life leverage. I... I've always subconsciously, when I listen to that book, you talking about life leverage, I was still in full-time employment. And that even to this day, I ex I've explained to pretty much anyone I have a co conversation with. And that has always stuck with me, that part of when I was listening. I actually remember I was, I was heading to New Haven when you mentioned about life leverage. That's how much it stuck with me, that mm. certain part of it. And now I'm very blessed that there is that balance of, you know, when we went to Disney and we were going to Disney again this year, is having that blend of... Daddy's got to do a little bit of work, yeah. but we're here opposed to me being in a warehouse or an office where I'm not here. And now we get best of both worlds. So yeah. that's um, and that comes down to time, doesn't it? Time is really ultimately the most important thing. And it's funny because I think with the employment world, people get too caught up on that. Well, I'm on this salary. Yes, but the salary doesn't give you that time. In fact, that salary that's holding you there is taking up a lot of your time. So I think I think that's where that is. I, I want to ask before we touch on a few other subjects, are we selfish? Uh, and what I mean by that is, do we really do this for our families and our children first? Or do we have to be selfish first in order for our family to reap the benefits? Okay, so if you go back to my fundamental belief about life, is that everything has an upside and a downside and everything has um, positivity and negativity in it. Therefore, I would argue we are equally selfish and selfless. So I think there are acts you can do in business that can be equally selfish and selfless. I'll give you an example. Selling anything. When you sell, if I sell something to you, the selfish act is I've made the money. The selfless act is I've given you something of service. If I am 100% selfish, that is called unfair exchange. And you're like, you ripped me off. Yeah. Whereas if I'm 100% selfless, I'm like, well, you're getting everything for free. Yeah. So I wrote in my book, Money, the formula for wealth. And I'm the only person on the planet that's come up with this formula for wealth. And I, I believe it to be the most accurate formula for wealth that there is out there. Wealth equals value plus fair exchange times leverage. Wealth equals value plus fair exchange times leverage. So if I want to get wealthy, I need to find something that's valuable. A podcast that millions of people listen to. Uh, a, a, a device that everyone wants to talk into. Okay, so I've found that valuable thing. But then I need fair exchange. If I've got this device and I, charge, I try to charge you 50 grand for it, you're going to realize a rip off. I'm not, it's not worth it. Um, whereas if I can't make a fair profit... I can't scale it. So in an ideal world, in business and life, the sweet spot is fair exchange. Mm. And that is equally selfish and selfless. So I've got two children. And 
I know when I got my son into golf and when I got my kids into karate, I could say to myself, yeah, well, you know, that's for the good of them. But there was a bit of vicarious parenting going on there. So there was a selfish driver. But actually, I think it's a pretty selfless thing to get your kids into martial arts. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy with that. Um, so when you become one-sided, that is when you will start to feel emotions as feedback to try and force you back into balance. If you're an artist and you give all your art away, in the end, you'll start hating the world and you'll feel mm -hmm. very resentful. And resentment is feedback to get you back into balance. But then if you carry on ripping people off, in the end, you're going to feel guilt. And the guilt is designed to bring you back into balance. So I think that every act is equally selfish and selfless, especially selling, especially like art. Like think about art. That the selfish act in art is I painted what I want. Mm. The selfless act in art is other people enjoy that. Mm. And I bet if you talk to an artist, none of them, if they were honest, would actually say, yeah, I just paint what I want. Yeah. Oh, so you want to be a broke artist and you don't want to sell any work. Surely you want some people to like that. No, nah, no, nah, I do. I paint what I want. No, you don't. You want <laughs> other people to like it. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. This podcast is sponsored by paulstapleton.co.uk, offering expert services in one-to-one -one mentorship. If you are looking for business consultancy, property sourcing training, social media advice, or sales negotiating, then this is the place to educate yourself. I think it is. I think it's a blend. I think you will come away eventually if you're giving too much for free, where you think, I'm starting to get a little bit peed off now. I want, I want some return on my time invested. Because that's another important thing, return on time invested. Um, something that is quite apparent, I don't know about you, since COVID, I have never known of so many relationships that I know that are getting divorced. Are we going into a world right now with social media being an incredible thing where we can go and build brands and businesses, collaborate, meet new people, huge opportunities, but at the same time, losing that old school connection of those relationships? Is that something that is happening right now? Is that a road we're going down? And if so, is there a counter? This is way above my pay grade to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh I don't know is the honest answer. So I'll just give you my opinion. No one quote me on this stuff. <laughs> is it a surprise to me that many relationships didn't make it through COVID? No, because COVID and lockdowns and everything around it is probably the one of the most extreme things that has happened in our lifetimes. Yeah. So there's probably many couples who don't spend that much time together. And the, I got taught by a very old person who's been in a relationship for 50 years. I said, what's the secret to long marriage? And they say, don't spend much time with your partner. Because <laughs> <laughs> over 50 years, you know, if you spend all day, every day with your partner for 50 years, so I mean, they were being flippant, but they weren't. Yeah. But we've all had an ex that lived in our pockets. And in the end, it was too much. So, we've, yeah. we've all, so it, was, it was flippant, but it wasn't. So just by the fact that people were chucked in their homes for months on end together, that's no surprise to me, logistically, that some marriages are going to end. Also, the emotional volatility. Mm. We all do the least amount of logical things when we are the most emotional. And we were probably all the most emotional through COVID. So it doesn't surprise me that many marriages have broken up and that COVID was the straw that broke the camel's back. So that would be that answer. In terms of social media, I'm, I'm fucking old school. And when I dated, I had to look at a girl over there and suck it up and neck a pint and brave it yeah. and go and talk to her. Yeah. And if I looked at her and she looked hot, she looked hot. And if she didn't look hot, she didn't look hot. There was no fucking filter. There was no, or there, was no there wasn't even Wonder Bras, mate, when I started fucking. There, there was no mis-selling. <laughs> you were getting the yeah, package. Yeah, exactly. What you see is what you get. And, and I had to brave it and go, and I'm sounding like an old bastard here, but I, I can completely understand why now, as someone dating and getting into relationships, oh, it is like overwhelming as hell. Number one, you don't know what this person is like. Number two, you don't know what they look like. And number three, it's probably very difficult to build social skills when you're stuck yeah. behind a phone. But it is the generation. I'm not saying it's wrong. Because it's like, every, remember, I believe everything has an upside. You and I have done very well out of social media. I've got, what, 1.5 million followers. I make millions of pounds out of social media. I'm not knocking. Social media is 
equally good and bad. But fuck, as a parent, it scares me a bit. Mm. It definitely does. Yeah, it does, does. me. Yeah. yeah, it does me. Oi, you're not going on socials. <laughs> <laughs> we're watching you. Uh, quick note. I mean, when Paul was dating, I mean, you were sending you were sending pigeons with notes on. Weren't you, <laughs> yeah. Back in the day. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it with is. your quill, yeah, yeah, <laughs> with the quill, yeah. But it is. I think anyone who's stepping into that entrepreneurial world, that business world, uh, you, you, let's face it, you have to be on social media. It might as well be under a rock if you're not. It's the new business window shop, but. I found myself, I've I've totally disconnected. So, you know, when people ask me, oh, how do you find it? Do you get really involved? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I, I am. I barely look at anyone's posts. Like I go on there, like Ed Sheeran says, it's just me, it's marketing, and then I'm out. Yeah. I don't want to get too emotionally involved because you can end up in this road of not knowing where you're going. And um, I, I think let's talk about some of the like major opportunities in terms of socials and brand building. You know, Simon Squibb, we see on TikTok a lot talking about the brand, the brand, the brand, the brand, the brand. What's your step-by-step -step process for anyone watching this thinking, well, I know I need to get on brand. Where do they start? Uh, platforms? What have you found? I think the first thing you've got to think about is what do you want to say? And yes, you can go on social media and test a few things, like I said, with the 12 month runway of freedom when you're starting your business. But you probably got to think about what do you want to say and what do you want to be known for? Because social media can become a trap. And if you just use social media to talk about anything and everything in the end, no one will hear your voice. And so Simon's a dear friend of mine and, and he loves talking about starting your own business. And he's very good at banging that drum and for me it was always business and entrepreneurship and now it's wider topics such as free speech and um having meaningful conversations with with people so that's that's step one step two then is you've probably got to look at um how do you want to use social media do you want to use it as a marketing tool do you want to use it as a way to connect with people um or do you want to go down the rabbit hole? Um, and if you want to go down the rabbit hole and you're doing stories all the time and it's very much a part of your life, that's fine if you've got that appetite. I don't really have that appetite. I use social media a lot, but there's a lot of my social media that's not, whilst it's me, it's not, perf I don't ever want to say I don't post on my social media, other people don't, because it always comes from me. Mm -hmm but it might have been repurposed or taken from one channel onto another. And it's probably been managed by someone else. You know, Harry edits all of our content, for example, on YouTube and podcast. And I've got my agent and assistant who's been with me 17 years. He takes my content and puts it onto LinkedIn and stories and stuff like that. Because like you, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of, I, I want to use it as a shop window and I want to put a nice display in that shop window and then I want to get out of the shop window and I don't want everyone looking at me 24 seven in that shop window. Yeah. Um, then what I think you've got to do is probably find the channel that works for you. So, you know, you talked about Simon there, Simon Squibb. Well, he's really blown up on TikTok and that's the channel for him. And for me, it's probably Facebook lives and the, and the audio podcast. YouTube's pretty good. Um, Clubhouse was good for me. I became one of the biggest followed people in like number 80 in the world followed on Clubhouse because I like live discussions. So Facebook lives work really well for me because you could just put a phone there and bang, Rob, talk about this. I'll go live. As soon as you say, hey, Rob, talk about this, this and this camera on not live. He's laughing because I hate monologues yeah. on pre-records, but I love live conversations. So I figured out after a lot of years, I like talking. I broke the world records for public speaking for talking. So live dialogues and monologues live I can do. So that's Facebook lives, audio, etc. So some people are good at short form, some people are good at long form. So then now you're like, okay, I know my, my passion. I know what I want to talk about. I know how much I involve, want to be involved on social media. And I know which social media channels work for me. I think that would be four stages of a good plan to get the most out of social media. Yeah, oh, no, I totally agree. I think I think picking those platforms for me, it's certainly 
TikTok has worked. LinkedIn is good for business. B2B still runs really nicely. And I think also there is this, going back to what we said at the beginning, like this overwhelm is real. I think you can get lost in almost a maze of never starting by going, well, hang on a minute. There's like six different platforms. Where is my audience? But as you said, I, I would totally second the fact that it starts with an audience, starts with like value, communication, which is going to tie really nicely into the next subject. Social media, obviously, we've just covered off, you know, how to sort of start that brand, where to start, things to look for. I'm... Um, I'm a real, uh, well, I would, I would say I'm really excited for the rest of this year in, in, in what it can bring in terms of opportunity. A lot of people, again, we touched on it earlier, don't start because of the fear of judgment of others and not starting and stuff like that, which ties in with who you're surrounded with. And there's a question, you probably get it all the time. I have it all the time. It's, it's probably, you know, every if I had a pound for every time I was asked it, how do I start a business? Or I don't, I want to leave my job. I want to do something. I want to better my family's life. I just don't know where to begin. My take on it is dude or whoever, environment, who are you surrounded with? Really, like honestly. And then secondly, learning, like education. Just start with yourself. Those are my two things, environment and education. What would your answer be to people who go, I want to start, but I have not got a Scooby? not got a scooby in what model to start in model or, where to start who to talk to networking where i'm in i'm in a i'm in a situation i want a better situation i don't know where to begin they might just be a pub goer normal person whatever no idea all right then so i do a lot of this content for people because i get asked it a lot yeah and i like to try and create little formulae for it let's do it so um i actually just posted this in a right okay so if you want to get a business from zero to six figures um i literally just wrote this yesterday number one you need clarity of the business model so at some point you need to decide how you're going to make money. What are you going to sell or create? Number two is you need to then get that product or service or idea to market. It needs to be ready or nearly ready. Number three then is you need distribution. So, okay, it's ready, but how do you distribute it? Have you got a supply chain or a supplier? Are you going to distribute it yourself through social media, etc.? By the way, this can be a product or it can be an information-based business. Number four, then, is you need a way to convert that into sales. Good value proposition, fair exchange, fair pricing, etc. Good conversion environments like good sales team, good uh, e-commerce site, etc. Then number five, you need to deliver, which is... Okay, so just because you've sold a load of stuff doesn't mean that there's going to be a happy customer at the end of it. So you've got to make sure you, you deliver on that. Um, and then systemize that delivery so that it's consistent. Because anyone can make a burger once, but only McDonald's can make, you know, a million burgers an hour or whatever they do. And then number six is scaling it up, scaling it beyond um, where do you want to be part time, full time or big time? Do you want to be entrepreneur, entrepreneur or empire builder? So I would regard myself as an empire builder. That's not me sitting here saying, look at my empire. But most people would say 360 property units and 18 million in sales and in the information businesses and 150 staff. I would certainly see that as an empire looking back at my 26 year old self. But there's a lot of decisions in that process that I could have made differently, which would mean I'm more of a intrapreneur, i.e. I could have stayed in the job that I got fired from. Or lifestyle entrepreneur, i.e. I could have just kept it to online courses on my laptop, kept it small, had outsources, etc. So then people ask me, how do you choose which business model to go in? So I've got seven tips on this. So number one, is it a business you can see yourself in for 10 years or more? Too many people start a business in because, oh yeah, AI, everyone's talking about chat GPT or yeah, I want to be a TikToker. But they haven't thought, do I want to be it in 10 years? Yeah. I think that's a good stress test. 
Um, number two, does this business model have upward growth? Because if you're trying to get a um, coffee shop or a restaurant down the high street, that might be on the decline, that kind of yeah. business model. So is it on the upward? Number three, can you create, this is massive, by the way, I wrote a book on this. Can you create multiple streams of income from the one thing? So in property, I earn from management, lettings, maintenance, buying and selling, capital growth, all the rental income, commercial, buy to let, multi let, writing books, doing training courses, podcasts, social media, Facebook group, blah, blah, blah. all of that from one business model called property. Yeah. It's not like I've got, I'm a doctor, I'm a dentist, I'm a lawyer, and I'm an accountant. Too many people, they start too many things. Number four, um, could you get recurring income from it? Mm -hmm. So um, a more modern business model is Netflix or, um, you know, these food companies that you subscribe to and they just deliver your food. And more and more now people want to be more agile, you know, the, the Airbnb culture. So instead of trying to sell something for 500 quid, could you sell it for 40 pounds a month? Mm -hmm. Okay, number five is, is the business that you're growing conducive to your life goals and plans? And for some people, a big business is not, and they shouldn't do it. But for me, it is. Um, oh, by the way, as well, you have to think about your partner. So if you are struggling a bit with your relationship with your partner or partners, it's either because they're struggling with the fact that you want to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. or you're struggling with the fact that they don't. And what we often do is go, oh, well, my ex, you know, she didn't want me to be an entrepreneur. She get hold it. She held me back. <laughs> maybe you courses. were, a, yeah, maybe you were a twat. You know, yeah. maybe you were like, well, this is my life. This is, you know, if I believe that everything is equally balanced, then in dating, it's selfish and selfless. And how many people when they're dating, like, well, I just want someone who does this and that and this and that and this and that for it's me and me. It's being preached too much. Yeah. Yeah. So, um. I was lucky. I didn't know it when I approached her face to face, <laughs> but my wife liked ambition. Yeah. So I, I suppose I lucked out there. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd give you some practical tips there. There's like 10 of them. No, very practical. And I, I would add just my two pence worth for when people say to me, how do I start a business? I would also say forward thinking up to the point, is it pandemic proof? Is it scalable? Is it digital? Is it online? Can someone buy it two, three times a month? Like you say, reoccurring. I think starting with the end goal of if we hit another pandemic, does your business survive? I use this case of when people say, I'm going to open up a shop. My, I always say this. I say, I love coffee. I love going on Instagram, finding a real nice vintage coffee house. But I wouldn't travel there every single day for 15 miles for a coffee. I get my quick cost of fix. Mm. Maybe at the weekend I go there. So is it scalable to people a mile outside of your radius? Not really. Does it work in a pandemic? Not really. So I would I would say that's another thing is, is, is a pandemic going to come around the corner? I want to touch on sort of as we come to a close, you've got a big, you know, you're great at putting out content that pops, you know, that gets gets the message in one way or another and really getting yourself out there, which is a confidence thing. A lot of people hold back because of confidence. You've got this big fight coming up. Um, just tell us a little bit about this fight coming up and, and you know, what's it in aid of and, and, and where's this going and, and stuff like that. Well, when you say big fight, uh, I'm fighting a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't look, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not a boxer and I'm not Jake Paul. But um, for those that don't know, we probably should have some context. Um, I went on a podcast interviewed by Samuel Leeds. And the first question he asked me was, I understand you can take me in a fight. Will you put your money where your mouth is? And I could see when he asked me, he didn't really think that, you know, I was going to. So I just immediately went 50 grand. Let's go. Because I felt like I could take him. I never planned to do um a white collar boxing or some kind of using my mid-level influence to, you know, do a, a property version of Jake Paul. Never intended that. But I just got called out and I just thought, you're a mouthy twat. <laughs> and, um, and look, he's got fans and he's got a good following. 
But a lot of people think he's a mouthy twat. And I know you won't open your mouth because you want to sit on the fence. <laughs> but I, I know as my right hand comes over his jab, a bit of you is going to be in that bunch <laughs> as well. So it seemed that a lot of people like wanted me to knock him out. So a- anyway, long story short is I bet him the 50 grand. He accepted but tried to wriggle. But then I just said, no, we're doing it. And then it turned into 100 grand. And... um. Yeah, now, I mean, we only put tickets on sale a few days ago and we've sold 900 tickets. So I suppose in the world of property entrepreneurs, well, this is the only fight there's ever been, so it's the biggest. Um, Yeah, so July the 1st, Brentwood, Essex, 1,700 people. If you haven't already got tickets, you'll want to be quick. A couple of VIP tickets, Rob, surely. (laughs) If there are any left, um, then... Yeah, I'm going to knock Samuel Leeds out. There we go. You just heard it. Yeah. Are, are you are you buzzing for it though? Like how are you feeling about it? Because it's um it's a buzz on the lead up. You know, I used to box myself and like we were talking about before. It's uh it's a buzz. Like are you looking forward to getting in that ring and and fit? it's cuz it's a different environment. It's a totally different environment. Are you looking forward to that cuz it's going to be a huge part. Adrenaline's going to be through the roof. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Um I'm not going to talk about my training. I'm not going to get, training. I'm not leaking anything. I'm training a couple of times a week on the beach, just chilling, you know. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Cu- cu- yeah, a couple of shadow boxing rounds. Look, <laughs> um, I'm going to win that fight. I'm going to love winning that fight. He's going to wish he hadn't gone in that ring with me. And then when I win, I'm going to give about £130,000 away to charity, which love is going to feel um, even better. And yeah, it's, um, I like to do new challenges every now and again and i've done various ones over the years i broke the world record for the longest speech 40 i smashed the world record by seven or eight hours when i did that we raised 120 grand for charity then so a lot of my challenges i do for charity so let's not forget this all right some people listen and don't like boxing don't like trash talk what about because some people said oh, this is just it's violence and i don't like it and what yeah. are you doing and you're supposed to be a professional and you're supposed to be in property it's £130,000 for charity. Yeah. Someone even said, well, why don't you just get him to give them? What? He's just going to give me a hundred grand for my charity. No, I'm going to have to knock him yeah, out to get two it. Two competing businesses yeah. in the same industry. <laughs> Rob, I've got hundred Gs for you outside. And I think it's great. Has it opened your mind up too? Because look, I love my fitness. Um, I'm training all the time. Uh, Paul, not so much, but I love training. Does it really open your eyes? Like, has it sort of, because I did a video not too long ago and it, and it it sort of it, it done all right. It done like eight hundred k views, and it was a brown fitness. And some people, honestly, the the split it's insane. Whereas I find it bizarre that bad habits like smoking, drinking, going out on a Saturday, and doing this and doing that, no one questions it. But yet, if you turn around and say, "I love prep food, love protein, I train twice a day," they're like, "You're a nut." As you know, what what's your thoughts on that? And and training in boxing is is totally different. Like it's it's, it's such a mindset. Like you got to get in the zone. How's that sort of tied in? You know, n- new new opening for you? Um, I've never, ever made myself out to be some expert in fitness. I'm not. Um, a 43-year-old guy who's got good energy, and that is a fact. Um, and I enjoy life. And that's, everyone who knows me knows those to be true. Um, other than that, here's what I would say on my pay grade. Um when you challenge yourself to do something that is outside of your comfort zone, new to you, public and competitive or combative, you will do things in your training you never believed you could do. And so, yeah, like, I'm going to give you a little leak. I'm training with a load of guys who are 21, 22, 23, 25, and I'm fitter than all of them. I'm faster than all of them. And I'm sorting them all out. And as a 40, actually, I'm 44. I said 43. I didn't add the VAT on. I'm 44 <laughs> I like that now. One. Stealing that. As a 44-year-old guy, I've got to say that does make me feel good. Yeah. Um, and I try and keep the ego down there, especially in, in boxing. You know, you've got the Humbles ego. You. Humbles you. Yeah, exactly. And look, I could get a big haymaker by in front of 1,700 people. I don't need to do this. I don't need the money. I could just write the check for a hundred grand. I just wanted to do something different and challenge myself. So one great lesson for me in this, and I relearned this, is 
Um, don't be comfortable. Comfort is the enemy of greatness. Challenge yeah. yourself, whether it's, you know, mountain climb or y- y- just some, I don't know, some kind of public challenge, yeah. some kind of CrossFit challenge or powerlifting challenge or or weight loss goal, but it's public and it's accountable. And it reminds you that you're you're not a glass house. Like, do you remember when you first sparred that 12-year-old who's a good boxer and you got your first wind, he's got his first... Uh, busted lip first bloody nose you were worried about it and once it happened he's, he's fighting he's yeah. fighting older kids he's a, he's a boxer by the way he's, mm. he's good mm. um he's solid you know so yeah. he's um yeah and it reminds you that oh it was uncomfortable on the first part but i fucking love it yeah like you know that that buzz of being in the ring it's um everyone's an equal which I, i'm a massive you know i'm just i'm a massive uh, pusher and believer of like everyone's everyone's the same love it um rob it's been incredible dude any final words just for anyone watching this really i suppose at that point of they want to do something they're getting that, that that sort of tingly feeling that light switch has gone off but they're uncomfortable to start from maybe judgment not knowing where to what what's your kind of top tip word of advice as we finish on people watching this wanting to start something so at the end of thousands of pieces of my content over the last probably decade, I have always finished with, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. And I think I'm not an advice giver. I'm an experienced sharer. However, if there were one piece of advice I would give, it would be that. Wherever you're comfortable, wherever you're bored, wherever you're lethargic, wherever you're yearning, wherever you're jealous, wherever you're unsatisfied if you don't risk anything you risk everything Mm. so start taking some risks start getting uncomfortable because people always ask me rob when's it enough and when's enough money and blah 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 and the honest answer is there is no end new level new devil and your reward for solving a problem is a bigger problem and everything that you perceive has all upside just has a new downside that you don't understand yet because you haven't experienced it yet So keep progressively taking those extra risks um, because I didn't need to do a public fight in front of 1,700 people with someone 35 kilos heavier than me. Like some people think this guy's a joke. I don't think he's a joke. No one who's 17 stone is a joke. I went and sparred yesterday with someone who's a rugby player who's been boxing for six weeks and he's a lot bigger than me and he was not easy to fight yeah. and he's a, he's quite new Trains he's a you. big strong rugby player who can just fall over me and swing and so this guy is no joke and i could get cleaned out in front of a lot of people and that's a risk and that's why i'm going to win yeah i love it oh mate i'm so i was pumped before <laughs> but i'm so and actually do you know what i just want to finish on that i like that new level new devil i love that take and progressively move forward and unleak your peak uh, unleash your peak. unleak your peak yeah <laughs> Un- that's a different kind unleak, of unleak unleash i have to check my top unlock your peak performance um rob mate absolute legend loved it super value super everything and uh and can't wait thanks cheers, for having guys. me on the show cheers mate